chapter 3. Turn with me there to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 20. Say amen when you're there. I'll be reading from the New King James. Amen. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as the prophet of the Lord. The word uh, prophet <laughs> there just means, he, or established means confirmed. It had been confirmed. All of Israel knew that uh, Samuel was established or confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. Now, um, you have to realize sometimes that we don't uh, always catch this, but a lot of the books of the Bible, we, see, we don't have a chronological order of Scripture. Because if we were going to tell you the oldest book of the Bible is not the first book of the Bible. The oldest book of the Bible is Job. It was written prior to the account that we have from Moses in the first five books of the Bible. Then you look at things like, okay, we just we went we had the judges, then they threw Ruth in there, and now we're looking at Samuel. But Samuel in this time period was this end of the time period of the judges. And so you have an overlapping time gap here where Ruth was kind of in the middle of that age, but we uh, looked at Ruth and it's kind of, it's a historical type of book, but it was removed um, from, it's kind of just put right in the middle of the judges period. So you had the beginning of the judges period, Ruth's thrown somewhere in the, in the middle of that, and then you have the end time of the judges uh, period. The history of the last judges of Israel are covered in 1 Samuel chapter 1 to about the 8th chapter. Uh, you'll see that this is still the end of the judges period. And a lot of uh, theologians will categorize Samuel as the last judge. Uh, we'll see Samuel as we study him uh, and his books. You will see that he was considered the last judge. He's considered a priest. And then 1 Samuel 3.20 tells us he was confirmed and established as a prophet. You see any similarities there of priest and prophet. Uh, now, during this particular time, we are seeing the decline of Israel. Remember a few months ago, I drew this, this cycle on the board of how Israel had operated and why God sent judges. They, would, they, they turned to God then they would get into rebellion and fall away from God and go towards idols. Uh, then they would cry out to God because they had realized what they had done. And when they cried out to God, then God would send them a judge or a deliverer. The judge there is not someone casting down condemnation. He really was acting as a deliverer to bring God's people back into a right relationship with God. And then God would hear their cry, send a deliverer. They would turn their uh, eyes towards God again then that cycle would continue. Now, we saw that throughout the judges. We gave you time periods and everything. So Samuel is towards the end of this time period, and we're really seeing a rapid decline of Israel during this time period. Now, Eli is the high priest. Have any of you heard of Eli? Yes. Eli is the high priest during uh, this time period, and the transition will be uh, in this first eight chapters here, of the leadership from Eli to Samuel. Uh, and then we will see in the latter part that Samuel takes over as the priest, prophet, and the last judge uh, of Israel. This is all in the first eight books. Now, under this particular time period, what covenant are the children of Israel under? The old covenant, the Sinai covenant, the covenant of Moses and the law. Where are they established now? Where are they living? Where are they dwelling? They're in the promised land. They've come, through, they've come out of Egypt. They've come through the wilderness. God sent them through 40 years. They were uh, kind of cleared out. He got all the bad blood out. And then they crossed over and they're in Canaan, Canaan land, the promised land. But they're still going through this cycle. Now we're looking at about 1100 B.C. to 1010 B.C. in this time period. Then from chapter 8 over to the end of the book in chapter 31... Uh, let me go back and say this. The first eight chapters, we, see, we are seeing the decline of a theocracy. 
What's a theocracy? We went over that earlier too. Theocracy is the rule by God. Then we had an anarchy during the time period of the judges. So we are still coming down from this decline of a theocracy. Why? Because the children of Israel are turning their back on God and they're asking for a king. Then chapters 8 through 31, we're seeing the rise of a monarchy. Through the book of Samuel, you'll find historically uh, the account of the first king of Israel and his, re his turn from God and then into the King David who was the wisest, of, not the wisest, the most known and most liked king uh, of Israel in this rise. So we'll see Saul and we'll see David here in the book of Samuel. This is a transition of leadership from Samuel as the priest and the prophet ruling over the people and the mouthpiece of God to a king King Saul and his reign. And then in the book, the end of the book, we will see a transition again from Saul to David. One of the things that you will see is that because of old covenant, and we've always talked about this, that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God would come upon men and women and then he would leave. He would withdraw his presence. But thank God in the new covenant, he said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. You received him and he's with you always, even to the ends of uh, of the earth, amen? But we will see this picture that God anoints Saul as king. He has Samuel anoint Saul as king. And he reigns as king for 40 years, but 38 of those years, the anointing of God's not on him. The spirit of God has left him. Now, we'll teach sometime soon or, or later <laughs> about the difference of the anointing in the old covenant and the, the anointing in the new covenant and what the anointing or unction of God does. Bill Johnson says it best, I think, like this. The Holy Spirit in you is for you. The Holy Spirit on you is for others. And the Holy Spirit in you never leaves you. Okay? So let's look here. At the beginning, we have Elkaniah, and he has two wives. I told, da uh, told David, I told Lisa earlier today, I did not realize, but doing further research, King David had eight wives and 19 sons. Uh, do you realize, if you'll look at Matthew 19, 3 through 9 and 1 Corinthians 7, verse 2, that God never intended on any of us having two wives, three wives, or more than one wife. Because even in the beginning when he told Adam, let me put a precursor on that or an asterisk beside it more than one at a time because we've debated down through years even how deacons can be qualified or not qualified because they're the husband of one wife what Paul was addressing there was not divorce he was addressing polygamy because if when you have to remember when he gave out those assignments who he's writing the letters to and what types of problems are going on in that culture and that society. Divorce wasn't running rampant. He wasn't talking about you can't be a deacon or serve in the church if you've been divorced. What he was saying is you can't be a deacon or be involved in leadership of the church if you're trying to maintain more than one household. Look at the context of the scripture. I don't know how David, Solomon, my word, how many wives and 700 concubines and no wonder he wrote Vanity of Vanities and all this vanity. But Elk and I had two wives, Hannah and Penina. And Hannah, he loved the most, and Hannah was without children. And Hannah's name means grace. And it's, yes, the Anna always is, refers to grace in both Hebrew and Greek. Even in the New Testament where you see the, in the temple, Anna waiting on the coming of the Messiah. Her name meant grace. So we have Hannah here who's asking God for a son. She cries out, to, you know the story. God gives her a son and then when God gives her the son, she gives him back to the Lord. And that's where Samuel goes under the tutorship of uh, Eli uh, in the temple. Uh, and when he's in the temple, he hears the, the voice of God, goes to, thinks it's Eli. He goes to Eli, have you heard the story? Then Eli finally says to him, you just, whatever that voice tells you to do, uh, you do it. So from a very young age, 
the voice of God was crying out. And we see the birth of uh, Samuel in chapter 2. And then let's look at chapter 3, verse number 1. Chapter 3, verse number 1. Now the boy, now boy here, uh, when the scripture uses boy, it's meaning someone under, the, a boy under the age of 12. So we have a specific time frame. 12, they became a man and they were referred to as young men. You would see the scripture start referring to them as young men after the age of 12. And so he's a young boy here. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Uh, in other words, what the I get I get a kick out of, and you you probably do too. All these folks that every other word is the Lord told me. The Lord told me. I don't know about you. I love to hear the voice of the Lord. Now it's a difference. I try to be very cautious, as my dad has taught me. There's a difference between you felt or you sensed. Or the Lord impressed upon you and saying, I, the Lord said. Now to me, when I say, if I say the Lord said, then I've heard his voice. Like you're hearing my voice right now. I've heard it one time in all of my life. An audible voice, just as if I would say, Bonnie. And you heard my voice. Now I've had tons of times and still do where I've, had scripture that have jumped off the page and I believe the Lord's speaking to me through the scripture or I've heard someone preach a message and from that message the Lord dealt with me. I've had leadings from in prayer time and you're praying about specific things and then you felt like you got an answer in your heart and then it's confirmed by a billboard or a commercial on television or you turn on the radio and you hear something that confirms or a, a message. Or There's all types of ways that the Lord can impress you and talk to you but this scripture is, here says that a, the word of the Lord was rare. Now, it's not capitalized here, so we know it's not the written word. There is no written word for them to go to at this time. So the word here has to be an audible voice speaking. Two things in the Old Testament. You had two groups uh, within the prophets. You had prophets who were seers, S-E-E-R. And you had prophets who were heard the voice of the Lord. Samuel heard the voice of the Lord. And he became a mouthpiece and what the Lord spoke to him, he spoke. He would speak out as the mouthpiece of God. Isaiah was a seer. How do we know? Because Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up in his train filled the temple and he spoke what he saw. So he was a seer. Do you see the, the difference? And so, yes, you can see visions and God can be speaking to you through those dreams and visions, but you didn't hear an audible voice. And it says here that the, now Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. What does that mean? Eli was the high priest and he was tutoring or mentoring Samuel. And in that mentoring, then Samuel would minister to the Lord as a priest before the Lord under the tutorship and mentorship of Eli. I still believe that, that that goes on today. I believe that pastors, ministers, men and women of God can tutor young men and women that are coming up and help guide them in the right direction. We know Paul had sons in the gospel that he uh, tutored and mentored. So there, here he's a boy, he's ministering before the Lord, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation the word revelation here is the same word for vision. Turn to Pro, uh, Proverbs 29. If you can just put it on the scripture, uh, the scripture on the screen for me. Proverbs 29, 18. She can get it up before I get to it, I'm sure. I don't have my device. Okay, here we are. New King James, I like it. King James says, where there's no vision. New King James takes that word vision and gives us where there is no revelation. 
the people cast off restraint. Now we're looking at grace, Genesis through Revelation, and if we're trying to find grace, then there has to be a revelation. What, uh, if I'm going to reveal, uh, these, uh, these young couples are having reveal parties nowadays. My buddy uh, Russ Jones down in Florida, he makes cakes. Now, he's a worship leader, but on the side he bakes cakes. Lord, he should have his own show. He's so good at it. And they taste really well. <laughs> good too. Uh, start talking about cake when you're not eating any. <laughs> Every commercial on television is some type of dessert or food. But he bakes cakes even for these reveal parties. You know, it'll be white icing on the outside and then you cut the cake open and it's either pink or blue. They're revealing something that, that had been hidden. In these reveal, I've seen all kinds of different ways these couples, have you all seen that on Facebook? Different friends and stuff are doing parties and all types of different things to reveal something that has been hidden. Where there is no revelation, I'm going to say it this way, where there is no unveiling of Christ, where Christ stays hidden, where grace stays hidden and there's no vision and there's no revelation of him and who he is, the people cast off restraint. King James says they perish. They're going to perish because there's no revelation of who Christ is. Then you jump over to 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, and it tells us in the latter verses there where it's talking about in verses 7, I believe, through 13, it talks about the administration of death written on stone tablets. What's that? The law, only thing that's ever been written on stone tablets. That if it's preached until this day, it places a veil over people's hearts and they can't see Christ. But then that administration or that uh, ministry of life of the Spirit, which is by Christ Jesus and what He did for us, it removes the veil, the veil, which is exactly what He did at the end of that old covenant system, transitioning into the new covenant system, when it even symbolized the veil in the temple being rent in two. Not just to give us access in, but also to expose that there wasn't even an ark back there representing the presence of God because it had been gone since the time of Jeremiah. But he begins to unveil himself to us. That's why it's so hard uh, once you've heard the message of grace, once you've heard about this administration of life, see, the law will bring death, but the Spirit gives life. And if we're still putting people back up under a mentality of old covenant, this Sinai covenant here, then we are literally veiling their hearts and their spiritual eyes from seeing who Christ is. And when we have this unveiling, the more we know about who He is, the greater revelation, unveiling, we have of who we really are. And so during this time period of Samuel, it, there is a widespread, widespread, there was no widespread revelation. So the people aren't hearing the word of God. There's not a widespread revelation going out of who God was and what he was doing for his people. Why? Because there was no mouthpiece. We'd come through the judgment, the judges period. We're at the latter part of that judgment period. The people don't like the covenant they're under. Why don't they like it? Because before it was even handed down, they said, yeah, we'll do that. But they knew they couldn't. And then they end up striving and struggling and always trying to, you know, about the time Sean and I were talking about, about the time you think, oh, I have arrived. I'm doing pretty good. Then they throw 10 more at you. And you're, you get to the point where you just throw up your hands and say, and so the children of Israel have come through this time period and now they don't want God to tell them what to do. And so the theocracy, the rule of God that they're under is declining and they're looking for, they want a king. Give us a king. Everybody else has a king. The Moabites have a king. The Amorites have a king. The Edomites have a king. We want a king. Give us a king. We want a king. And so now you have this decline. And in the, in the transition period of this, there's, there's a widespread 
There's not a widespread revelation of who. And unfortunately, I was telling Dr. Howes this at dinner one night. There is, I can't hardly turn Christian television on. I'm just talking to you about me right now. This is not about you. And you listen, you can glean from anyone. Don't ever throw somebody out because one part of what they said was not what you agreed with. So, you know, I can glean from Bishop Jake, Stephen Furtick, Jensen Franklin, all these guys. I don't have to agree with everything that they say. But it's difficult for me to turn on Christian TV once I've had this revelation, this unveiling, to go back up under and listen to something that tries to that throws a veil back over it. it it's it's kind of like this. To, this is just my thinking in all of it. These are prayer calls for toddlers and infants, if you ever have any children that are sick or infants in the hospital, these are prayer cloths for infants and toddlers. So, Kathy made those. It's got grace life on it. It's a prayer pal. We anoint them, we pray for them, we send them out to the children. Okay? So if you ever have that come up in your family or sphere of influence, that's what those are for. Okay, here's the owl. And it's like, okay, it was covered up. It was hidden and then we reveal it. And just like you all did a few, oh, it, I told you what that was, gave you more information about it, the more you understood about what it was, oh, isn't that, isn't that sweet? And so now you know what it is. But it's like we, we, we unveiled Christ and then now you become a believer and we cover him back up and you never get to know any more about him. But every once in a while, we'll tell you a little bit of good news about him. <laughs> Just enough to keep your appetite wet, but we're going to still beat the hell out of you every week. Okay? But then, oh, at the end of the service, he's good. And so now we have such a mixture of preaching that we think Christ has been unveiled, but we struggle with our identity because the revelation keeps getting covered back up. The Bible tells us that God is manifold. That means there's many folds to God. He's multifaceted. If the angels that Isaiah was talking about circle the throne continually crying out, holy, 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 they've been doing it since time began, well, before there was even such a thing as time, and they'll continue to circle the throne and say, holy, holy, holy. Why are they saying that? Because every time they pass the throne, they see a different facet, a different color, a different fold of God. There's colors you've never heard of. There's sounds you've, that we've never heard. There's feelings and emotions we've never experienced. But as Christ is unveiled to us, and this manifold God begins to be understood, then that gives us a better and better unveiling and picture of ourselves. Because the new covenant, when you open it up, it is a mirror. It is a mirror. When you look into the new covenant and you begin to read the new covenant, you are unveiling Christ. And as you unveil Christ, He's unveiled, because that's just like he said in Matthew 16. When he asked the disciples, he said, who do men say that I am? And he went through, well, some say you're Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist, come back to, to life, all these different things. He said, who do you say that I am? Peter, the mouthpiece of the group, speaks up, and he says, some, I say you're Christ. You're the anointed one. And Jesus said from the message, Bible, he says, hey, you didn't read that in a book. My Father in Heaven revealed that to you. There you go. There's that revelation, that unveiling. And so when Peter got that revelation, then Jesus responds to him and says, Now that you know who you are, let me tell... This is Message Bible, Matthew 16. Let me tell you who you really are. People have been seeing you as a pebble. People have been seeing you as this little stone that if it gets stuck in between your sandals and your foot, it causes irritation. <laughs> but I don't say you're a pebble. You are rock. Rock Johnson. You are P Peter. Not Simon, but Peter. 
So because Christ was unveiled by divine revelation to Peter, then Christ began to reveal to him who he really was. And in that unveiling, in that revelation, that unveiling of Christ, he begins, if you look in the context of the scripture, because he knows who Christ is and now he has his identity in Christ, then the keys of the kingdom are handed to him. And to each of us, here's the keys of the kingdom. What do keys do? They lock and unlock. So you can loose things that are already loosed in heaven. You can bind things that are already bound in heaven. Why are we doing that? Because just like Dr. Howe says, we are bringing heaven to earth. And there's going to be a culmination of that. But we are calling heaven in those things. Do you know in heaven there's no sickness? So we call in, in, into the earth no sickness in our body. Because that's what heaven is being manifested on earth. There's no tears in heaven. Now, do we go through things that cause tears? Yes, but when we do, we weep not as those in the world weep because we have a hope, and so we call down heaven where there are no tears into our situation, an unveiling. Verse 2, chapter 3. And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see and before the lamp of God went out into the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was. And while Samuel was lying down, the Lord, look at that, the Lord called Samuel and he answered, here am I. Um, so he ran to Eli. Uh, isn't it amazing? that when he heard the voice of the Lord, he thought that someone else was speaking to him. What's the correlation here? Sometimes I believe that God speaks to us through a familiar voice. And so I believe that Samuel, knowing that probably he and Eli were the only ones there, heard a voice that sounded similar and familiar to him. He went to where he thought the voice came from. Verse 6, then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel rose and went to Eli. Here am I, for you called me. And he answered, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, nor was the Lord word of the Lord revealed to him. This is where I'm going with this. I believe there is a time... It, there is a process of time that you, you'll know the Lord. That means you'll come and experience someone will share to you his finished work and you will place your faith in that and you'll come to him and he'll be your savior. Taking, wiping away your sins. But there is a continual process of the Lord speaking to you and dealing with you that will continue to unveil to you who he is and you, that process can go on and on and on and on because he's so vast. Amen. So just because we've come to Christ, don't, we don't expect that in the first day we know everything about him. We know him as Savior when we come to him. But there'll be times when we'll know him as healer. There'll be times when we know him as deliverer. There'll be times when we know him as lifter of our head. There'll be times that we know him as our shield and our buckler. There'll be times that we know him as our high tower and the righteous can run into him. So there's all types of of unveilings and revelations. So here, Samuel did not know the Lord, that it was the Lord speaking to him. And I believe there's a lot of unbelievers that are fe hearing, feeling, sensing, pulling, having a tug and a draw to the Lord, but they don't know what it is yet. So it's our job to help mentor them along and encourage them. And so that's why it's always good for us never to be condemning, condescending, pointing accusing fingers and judgmental because when we do that then they miss they have a misconception of who that voice is and what that voice is saying to them whether it's one on one with people or whether it's from the pulpit and that will help them come to know the Lord and then when they come to know the Lord that's a part of the unveiling of who he is as Savior but there's a continual unveiling and a I know more today than I knew five years ago. 
And when I look at scripture today and I look at the new covenant today with the glasses of grace on and I look through the lenses of the cross, I see things in scripture that I've never seen and we've read the Bible through so many times that in the Amplified, in the New King James, in the King James, that's one thing that blows me away about Dr. House. He knows the Bible. Inside and out, can quote King James to you, but he can quote Amplified to you, he can quote Message to you, he can... Living waters pouring out. And so it was amazing to me to hear that, but yet we can have this continual unveiling. Now, here's, here's a good... Uh, uh, point of instruction, not condemning or condescending or putting heaviness on you. You will never have a continual, back up. It will be difficult, I'm not going to use the word never. It will be difficult in that process of continual having Christ unveiled to you if you don't get in the word. If we're not reading the word, I say, I'm not putting a duty and a work on you that if you don't read, this is not going to happen to you. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is to you, the process takes longer and we won't understand what we need to understand when we need to understand it without the help of the Lord. And that's why we, we need to have a desire to want to get into the Word because it's a reflection to us. We begin to see ourselves when we open up the Word. Yeah. I used to skip over the begats. This one begat that one, and that one begat that one. Uh, there's not a whole lot of revelation in that, but there is a lot of revelation in that because it will point you to different things if you go through those things. So even the things that we don't want to read sometimes can help bring a revelation to us of who Christ is. I encourage you to get into the epistles. Begin to look at what Paul... See, a lot of the things that Jesus said in the, in the red, Paul explains to us in the epistles. And like Dr. House says, and we've said so many times, just because it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John doesn't mean it's New Covenant. So you have to know where the dividing line is. Where's the dividing line? Well, who's the audience? And then after the cross. That's the, the dividing points in that. Okay, anybody getting anything yet? Verse 8. So we've had two times now that the voice of the Lord has spoken to Samuel. He's gone to Eli, thinking that was Eli. Eli told him both times to go back and lie down. And then he says, verse 7, Now Samuel did not know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And then the Lord called Samuel the third time. So he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord, so who perceived it? Eli. Eli. Because of his maturity, because of the years that he had walked with the Lord and heard the Lord's voice, and he knew that he wasn't speaking to Samuel, so he had, those were the only two guys there in the temple. <laughs> Therefore, Eli, verse 9, said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Say that with me. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. That's all we need to say. We don't have to beg him. We don't have to plead with him. We don't have to be with, stay with me for just a second because sometimes people will say, uh, say I'm crying out for you. Um, well, if that crying out means you're praying, good. But if that crying out means that you're doing something demonstrative or you're going through type, some type of ritual or you're screaming because you don't think God can hear you, let me say this, there are desperate situations that come on to us sometimes in life. And when we are in those desperate situations and we don't sometimes feel that God is there, in our desperation and from our humanity, not from our spirit, but from our humanity, we will use desperate measures to get through that desperate situation. And let me tell you, I have been there. Okay, so my outward body language and my uh, demonstrative uh, things that I might not might do isn't because God's not hearing me or or think that I think I have to do something to get God to hear me. We just go through things sometimes in life. Okay, nothing wrong with that. 
What we need to do is make sure that when that woman shows up with that alabaster box and she breaks it open, she begins to weep and cry at his feet and dry his hair with her hair, his feet with her hair, that we're not judging the performance or the action of what she was doing. She was in a desperate situation that caused her to do desperate things, to show her love for her master. Okay? So we want to put that out there to let we know we never want to, because you have the freedom in this place to do whatever you need to do, however you need to do it, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit to get your worship out. Okay? So that's not what we're talking about. But I do want you to understand that in the spirit realm, we don't have to beat things and cry with a loud voice. You can whisper and God will hear your voice and come to you. So, Lord, speak your servant here. So Samuel went and lay down his place. Verse 10. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Now, I want you to notice something here. Go back to verse 4. Look at verse 4. The Lord speaking. What does he say? What does the Lord say? What does the Lord say? No, Samuel said, here am I. The Lord called and he said, Samuel. How many times did he speak his name? One time. Okay, go down and look at verse 6. Yet the Lord called again. What did he say? Samuel. Verse 8. The Lord called Samuel again. <laughs> you know where I'm going. Look at verse 10. And the Lord came and stood and called. Now look, this time the Lord came and stood. And called as at other times. Now the other times we don't see God standing in his presence. We just hear him see that he spoke. This time it says the Lord came and he stood and he spoke. And what does he say this time? <laughs> Go through the scriptures and see how many times that Jesus used somebody's name twice. Martha, Martha. There is, there's something in that repetitive that you really, un, okay, now the Lord is speaking to me and I know that it's his voice. Samuel, Samuel. He says it twice this time. Samuel answered, speak for your servant hears. And the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. Isn't it something that at this time he's going to tell He's telling Samuel that he's going to tell Israel something that's going to tingle their ears. Well, you get over to the New Testament and you hear so that people are looking for something to tingle their ears. <laughs> In that day, I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vow and he did not restrain them. His sons were eating and drinking the, the bread and the wine that were in the temple. They were having orgies in the temple. They were doing all kinds of vile stuff in the temple, and they were priests in the temple under their father Eli, who was the high priest. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So it could be atoned for, and, and that sacrifice was once a year. It shall, not. shall not, I'm sorry, but it could be. If they'd have received it, just like us. Thank you. So Samuel laid down until morning, and he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Watch. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he answered, here am I. And he said, what is the word? Remember, there's been a famine of the word. There's not been widespread revelation. What is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. So he realized that after coming, after Samuel coming to him three different times, that the Lord was trying to tell him something. And so now Eli says, what has the Lord told you? Because I know he's been talking to you. Uh, let me throw this out there real quick. Don't look for a word from somebody else. 
If it comes, great. But don't go seeking out a word from somebody else. That's old covenant. In the new covenant, the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you. Holy Spirit wants to guide you. Holy Spirit wants to direct you. Now as an immature believer right off the bat, you'll need different words to encourage you and inspire you and get you on your journey. Then as you grow, you may seek out confirmation from words that God has given you. And those confirmations could come in various different ways. But I believe that if you will stay on the journey with the Lord in this process and the unveiling and revelation of who He is, you will get to a point in your life that when you hear from God that you will know with the shadow of doubt that it is the Lord speaking to you and even then He will bring confirmation without you seeking it out. So as a believer, young in the Lord, yes, you probably will need to listen for words and try to find out how the Lord's speaking to you and dealing with you, but as you mature and you know that you've heard the voice of the Lord, you will seek out confirmation to know, just to assure yourself that, but you will get to a point long enough in the journey that you know that you know that you've heard from the Lord and he still will give you confirmation without you seeking it out. Now Samuel, Eli knows that Samuel has heard from the Lord. And he says, tell me what son, all the things that God has told you and don't hide anything. Then Samuel told him everything, hid nothing from him, and he said, it is the Lord, let him do what seems good to him. Verse 19, so Samuel grew and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. That means people heard the words that Samuel said. And all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself. Here it is. We started off with there's no revelation, and now by the end of the chapter, the Lord appeared and revealed himself to Samuel by the word of the Lord. So in that 21 verses, we go from no widespread revelation of word of the Lord to now God has chosen a mouthpiece that he's giving his word to and he's revealed himself to him by the word of the Lord. That means the Lord continued to talk to, now I want you to look at a couple things here as we conclude. The Lord continued to talk to Samuel and Samuel continued to share what the Lord had shared with him until none of the words that he shared with people fell to the ground. This is my interpretation. Samuel heard from the Lord. He gave Gary a word that the Lord had given to him. Gary received that. It came to pass. The prophecy came to pass. He begins to share it with Jerry. Then the word of the Lord comes to Samuel the prophet and he gives Jerry a word. And the word is, comes true, fulfilled in his life. And now Gary and Jerry go on and they share it with Joe. And then it continues. And then everything that he said has come to pass. And so from Dan... We're in Canaan land and the sections have been divided off to the tribes. From Dan to Bathsheba, everyone knew that when Samuel came to town that he had been confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. I don't know about you, I still believe in prophets. I believe God has prophets uh, to this day. Um, now that's an office. That, and the office of a prophet God gives direction at different times for different situations from that office. But any of God's people can prophesy. You don't have to hold the office of a prophet to prophesy. Uh, you can prophesy without having that office and it, prophecy may come upon you from time to time. Prophecy always edifies, builds up, and encourages so if you receive a word from a self-proclaimed or so-called prophet and it does not edify you, it does not build you up, and it doesn't encourage you, I encourage you to say, I don't receive that in Jesus' name. Because you can either receive it or not receive it. That's up to you. Uh, now how do I know that it's a prophecy? Because sometimes God does give warnings. Now here's the difference. A warning or a hold steady, sometimes those are words of wisdom and knowledge. 
If he gives us a knowledge about something that's to come, like if he shows us, you know, it's not on the weather radar and it's not on, uh, you know, the, the weather channel and God reveals that there's a potential dangerous ice storm to you and you should avoid such and such area, that's not a prophecy. That's a part of God's knowledge. That's a word of knowledge that if you'll listen and heed to that, you can go around it and be safe and go on down your way. Uh, words of wisdom come that will bring wisdom in different situations. So those are different types, but prophecy, and then there's tongues. There's a lot of confusion in the church, but we're very clear here about it. Uh, if I call on Sean to come and pray, and he prays in his native language, when he begins to pray in English, he's not talking to you. Nowhere in Scripture is prayer directed to the people. Prayer is to the Father in Jesus' name. That's communicating with Jesus. So if we ask Sean to come for public prayer and he begins to pray publicly and he's praying in his native tongue English and he begins to pray out, then he's talking to God and we can agree with him. Here's just a little bit of advice in prayer. To agree with someone, you can't be praying louder than they're praying because you can't hear what they're praying and so you don't know how to agree with them. Now there are times when we all pray. You can get as loud as you want to get. Okay? So if I call on Sean to pray and he comes up here and he begins to pray in tongues, he's not talking to you. So you don't need an interpretation. <laughs> that was received well. That's Bible. Now, Sean gets up on his own prompting of the Holy Spirit and he begins to address the congregation in tongues. Then someone else, not Sean, someone else is to interpret that. And the tongue that was given to the body with the interpretation equals prophecy. Okay? Now, we've been told of a story recently, this just blows my mind. That in Indiana, in a service, a man was visiting and he's sitting in the back and he has his cell phone on, speaker phone. He's got it down here. Okay? She's listening to the service. During the service, so he's sitting in his chair, the speaker phone on right there beside him. In the service, someone gives, gets up and gives a word in tongues. And there's no interpretation. She's in a different state listening on the telephone. And she had the interpretation and she's trying to get her husband's attention, screaming and hollering at him. She finally gets his attention. He takes the phone to the front and says, my wife has the interpretation. She's on the phone in a different state. They put the microphone up to the... And she gives the interpretation. So don't put God in a box. This has been my experience. Most tongues that I've heard given in church services that were addressed to the congregation, the person giving the tongues wasn't out of order. The person that was to give the interpretation was. Most of the time, because here's what happens. I, I've, I've preached in Haiti with a French dialect. I've preached in Mexico with a Spanish dialect. I've preached to the Tarascan Indians and they've had interpretation. And sometimes I'll go for five, ten sentences and they'll give two or three. And so someone gets up and gives a three minute word in tongue and whoever has the interpretation thinks that they have to give a three minute interpretation. It might be one word. God could say all of this over here to get one word to us. Jamie, you're not giving a translation, you're giving an interpretation. That's right. It's not a translation. You're not translating word for word, you're giving an interpretation. Sometimes a paraphrase of what Holy Spirit is saying. So if we invite someone to come and publicly pray at Grace Life in the microphone and they begin to pray in the Spirit, or if Michaela's up front and she's praising God in the spirit. The praise that we give is never directed to the congregation. The songs that we sing, and the, that's right, shouldn't be. And the praise that we give is always to the Lord. So if she begins to sing in the spirit from the platform, I'm not scared of that. Why? Because she's not praising me. 
she's praising him or if it's anyone that we call on. So I'm, I'm not, I don't have any fear in that direction. And I think a lot of times we've hesitated from certain things. Number one, because it hasn't been taught properly. And there's an ignorance about it. And when there's an ignorance about it, then we, we bring fear on people. So we're not, we're, not shy, we're not shy about that. We're not going to back away from that. But so that you understand, if I pray in the Spirit, if someone else prays in the Spirit, and it's public in the microphone, it doesn't have to be interpreted. Now, if I'm addressing the congregation with a word of tongues, then someone else will have the interpretation. What my problem is is some of these hairy ducks that will prophesy and give tongues to people and then thus saith the Lord, they begin to interpret. That's not biblical. From what I read. To one is given the tongues to another, the interpretation. <laughs> Stand to your feet. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. You're asking me. This is how I do it. I put it up against the Word of God, and I put it up against what I feel the Lord has been telling me and dealing with me. And is this prophecy edifying me? Is it building my spirit man up? Or is it causing, oh, well, you know, if it's bringing fear, it's not from God. Anything that brings fear is not from God. He doesn't give us the spirit of fear. Uh, and then I have to, what have you been telling me, Lord? Okay, does that line up with where you're directing me? Uh, now, if you have an immature believer, I, this is just me. If, the, if someone is an immature believer in this body, uh, say Ralph goes over and gives Sean a word and Sean's a brand new Christian and he doesn't understand it, he needs to go to a spiritual authority. Or even say to the individual that's giving him the word, have you checked this out with pastor? If you're in a church setting in the church, if you're out somewhere in a home group or whatever, that's your business. But in here, the gifts of the spirit are subject to the offices of the church. So the gift never supersedes the office of the church. Uh, and, and that's just me. And so I would check it out against what I feel the spirit has been telling me and what the word of God does and is it building me my spirit man up at all yes sir the one thing that sticks out to me in the talking about the other day was when Samuel called uh, when Saul called Samuel up through the witch now don't get ahead of me brother Samuel's a prophet <laughs> right we yeah Samuel's prophet. so when Saul inquired of him and he spoke to him did he give him a prophecy mm -hmm. Who gave him a word of knowledge, word of knowledge yep. about what's to come, and there could be warning. The same thing can happen. A layman can be anointed to give a prophecy. You understand? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. Yes, a lay, any lay person in the church can give a prophecy, even to the spiritual leaders of the church. Now, what the spiritual leader does with that is up to the spiritual leader in the church, not not the person who gave the prophecy. Uh, I have 15 hours on the gifts of the Spirit if anyone wants. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can pray in the Spirit publicly, and a lot of times that can lead into prophetic. Because as the Spirit begins to uh, stir up that gift and you're praying in the Spirit, you're building up your holy faith when you're praying in the Spirit. And so a lot of times prophetic comes out of that gift of the spirit of, of tongues. Now I'm going to go right out here where I believe. And again, everything that we say that we believe is out there for you. We're reporting it. And you decide. Okay. Uh, I believe that every believer receives the gift of tongues. Okay. That's my personal opinion. How do you know? Open up your mouth. It says he'll feel it. Now, I don't believe in giving you a sheet of paper and saying, say this word real fast 10 times. I don't believe in forcing it on people and saying, oh, you didn't get God because you didn't say this. I don't believe that. You'll know when you got it. Just practice it. How does a baby start talking? They don't have sentences 
right off of the first bat, um, Mary Elizabeth was pretty close. <laughs> that girl's been talking from day one. But you start off with sounds that lead to phrases that lead to sentences. Same thing with the, the gift of the Spirit. I, hey, look down at your shoes, men, because a lot of times women don't. Your tennis shoes, my shoes, I didn't buy the tongue separately. They came with my shoes. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. This is good. I like it.